Hello everyone. In this episode, I'm going to be pitting the Anvil Terrapin up against Origins 315P. I paired these two ships up for a number of reasons. First off, both of these ships are specialized for the Explorer career path. They belong to the same size classification, they can be optimally run by the same number of crewmen, they come with a very similar set of amenities and features, and because both of them are the highest tiered level ships that still fit within the Pathfinder category. Now the first thing I should do before I get too deep into this is to define for you what a Pathfinder is. As of right now, there's only two designations for ships when it comes to the exploration career path, which are Pathfinders and Expedition Class Vessels. The Pathfinders consist of ships that are considered to be your introduction into the exploration field. And it includes vessels such as the Aurora ES and the LX, the Mustang Beta, and of course the Terrapin and the 315P. While the Explorer category is made up of larger craft, that includes the Freelancer Dur, the Aquila, the 600i, the Corsair, and the Carrick. In order to be classified as a Pathfinder, the ship needs to have a greater degree of autonomy than you'd find in your average vessel. This includes having a bed to act as an onboard save spot and some kind of internal cabin space or storage compartments. It often comes equipped with better than your average scanners, and usually has some ability to satisfy at least one or more aspects of the game's survival mechanics. All of these things contribute to the ship's ability to remain away from its main base of operation for extended periods of time. Honestly, I think that the Terrapin and the 315P are in a class of their own. One that stands well above the other Pathfinders, while still not being quite at the same level as the Expedition class vessels. Both of these ships have a very similar list of features. They're outfitted with accommodations for a crew of one, and they have some interior space that the pilot can get up and move around in. They have a comparable number of onboard facilities that includes a bathroom, a bed, some form of internal storage space, and an area that's been set aside for food preparation. One big difference between these two is that the 315P is a civilian class explorer ship, while well, the Terrapin is a military explorer craft. The second thing that I'm going to have to define is what exploration is, or at least what it means within the confines of the Star Citizen universe. Exploration is going to be one of the last of the career paths to be flushed out. This is simply because you need to first define what explored space is before you can travel out past it. It's also going to be highly tied into the land claiming mechanic. But most importantly, it's going to represent the first link in the chain when it comes to player created content. Explorer ships are going to be responsible for traveling out to the edges of the established shipping lanes, and from there they'll cast out their sensors well beyond the ranges and capabilities of other vessels. This will allow them to be able to locate previously undiscovered points of interest that they can venture out to. Once they've gotten close enough, they can identify what their scanners have picked up in more detail, and then be able to set up either a beacon or record the nav point location so that it can be found again. And most importantly, they're going to be able to return safely back to established space so that they can reap the rewards for having found these discoveries. This is how information brokers and private individuals are going to become aware of specific kinds of ore deposits, derelict ships to salvage, and other points of interest for career-specific ships to be able to venture out to and harvest for themselves. This will allow them to earn a living without having to waste precious amounts of game time hunting these locations down on their own. For instance, a Reclaimer Captain could purchase the coordinates of several large wrecks that were located relatively close to one another, so that during their next gaming session, they could jump directly to these locations and spend their time salvaging it, rather than flying around aimlessly looking for random bits of scrap to dismantle. The majority of the coordinates for these points of interest would have been previously discovered by an explorer ship. Now the biggest difference between these two ships is how they're going to go about turning a profit from these discoveries. The 315P is going to have some limited ability to record the specific locations of these points of interest, but a majority of their profit is going to come from bringing back the most valuable artifacts that they can salvage from it. This includes grabbing the best components and equipment from a wreck, or by mining small but precious gems from an ore vein or asteroid by hand. While the Terrapin will be strictly used for recording the coordinates and detailed information on what it finds, and is going to be primarily using data information as a commodity for trade.
The 315P is developed by Origin Jumpworks. Origin is best known for creating an extensive array of high-end spacecraft. And over time, they've developed an exclusive customer base, which consists of the rich and powerful alike. This is reflected in their company motto, which is selecting an Origin design doesn't just mean buying a ship. It means choosing a lifestyle. And this motif typifies the impression that one gets the second that they step aboard an Origin touring vessel, which so far includes the 100i, the 300 and 600i, as well as the 890 jump. Origin strives to incorporate luxury into every one of their designs, while at the same time making sure it excels at the level of craftsmanship that also goes into the utilitarian aspect of the ship. This concept has been woven into their extended list of vessels, like the rest of the 300 series, the 85X Snubcraft, and their X1 series of Gravlev bikes. The 315P is a member of the 300 lineup, and all the ships within this family are based on the same basic chassis design that's found on the 300i, which, at its heart, is purely a touring vessel. So as a result, all the other ships in this series have inherited the same luxury-styled cabin, its layout consists of a single open space that has a bed that's been built into a niche along one of the walls. It also has a standalone bathroom, a weapons rack, and plenty of shelf space that you can use to display vanity items on. It also has an area that's been set aside specifically for food preparation. A long window extends from one side of the ceiling to the other, which gives a beautifully unobstructed view of the surrounding sky. All these elements make the cabin space feel very open, even though in reality it's a confined volume of space that's had a good amount of stuff packed into it. The 315P has two size 3 weapon mounts that are located on the wings, and it replaces its nose gun with a utility mount that comes equipped with a sure grip tractor beam. It has two size 2 missiles and has a top speed of 1223. It can use the afterburners to accelerate to almost three quarters of its top speed without overheating the engines and it can use the space brake to go from full burn down to a quarter of its speed before the engines start to feel the strain and begin shutting down. The 315P's computer system, power plant, quantum drive, jump module, and quantum fuel tank are all small components, and it only comes with one of each. It has two small coolers, shield generators, fuel tanks, and fuel intakes. Its maneuverability is better than the Terrapins in nearly every way by a factor of 10 to 20 meters a second. The view from the cockpit is among one of the best for a vessel of its size, which seems to be a common staple among Origin ships. For amenities, it has a bed, a bathroom but no shower, a weapons rack, shelves for displaying knickknacks, a mini fridge, and a countertop space for holding a coffee machine and a food maker. It can also come with other custom options like a sound system, a hollow clock, and a picture frame. Another standout feature for this ship is the oversized cargo bay. The cargo grid for the ship is uniquely located on a platform that can be lowered down from the belly of the vessel, and when not in use, it can be retracted back up into it. This ensures that your cargo will be well protected by the ship's shields and hull plating during transit. And there's another aspect of storing your cargo in this way that I like, and it's that this method provides you with the ability to open up the cargo bay without having to expose the rest of the ship, which can help to prevent stowaways from getting aboard your vessel. Certain ships like the Cutlass Black and the Valkyrie have to open its rear cargo bay in order for you to get in and out of it. And it's a common tactic for shipjackers to target vessels like this. And as soon as the ramp to the cargo bay is finished descending, they'll rush on board and hide somewhere inside. And once they get on board, they can either steal your ship outright or shoot you in the back of the head after you've left the armistice zone. The 315P's method for transporting cargo completely eliminates this problem. It's the best of both worlds when it comes to storing your cargo internally, while at the same time allowing you to access it externally. The ship can carry a total of 12 SCUs worth of cargo, which is the largest amount that any vessel in the 300 series can transport. The cargo grid is divided up amongst two lifts that can be operated independently of one another, so you can lower just one or the other at a time, or both together in unison. The cargo grid can be used for more than just acting as a light freighter. It can lock down anything that fits onto it. This could include storage boxes that hold additional equipment, choice bits of hand-mined ore, mint condition components, or ship weapons that have been salvaged from a derelict, and pretty much anything else you may have come across during your travels. 
The tractor beam is going to add another layer of versatility to this ship. A lot of other vessels that come with a tractor beam have them mounted onto the stern or along the underbelly of the ship, which means that they're going to be best suited for towing things behind or underneath them. Well, the 315P has this tractor beam mounted front and center of the cockpit, which is going to make it a lot easier for the pilot to be able to do precision work with the tractor beam. Like for instance, if you're moving something like a small vehicle or a cargo box, it needs to be carefully placed down in a specific location. There's one last aspect of this ship that I wanted to address, and it's about using it as a vehicle transport. The cargo ramp is big enough to fit a gray cat onto it, maybe even two. But the real issue is that you're not going to be able to retract the ramp while it has a vehicle on it. So if you want to use a 315P in this way, it's going to only be able to transport your golf cart from a spawn point to somewhere else that's located within flying distance. That doesn't require a quantum jump. I'm sure that some imaginative explorers are going to come up with a number of practical uses for this, but for now, if you're looking to transport a small vehicle, there's better ways to do it. You can also fit a gravlev bike onto this platform, but when the 315P's landed, there's not enough room under the ship for a gravlev to even reach the ramp. So I tried it again, but this time from space. And it does fit onto the ramp. But once again, you're going to find yourselves having the exact same issues with transporting a gravlev bike that you had with transporting a grey cat. The Terrapin was developed by Anvil Aerospace near the end of the 28th century, where it had the honor of being the first ship to be commissioned into service as part of the UEE's restructuring of the Navy. Over the last 150 years, the Terrapin has seen extensive military service, cementing its reputation as a support ship. During that time, the ship has been used as a standard APC, a long-range explorer, and as a combat-ready search and rescue ship. It came under this last role after repeated testing had proved its ability to perform precise combat pickups while under heavy enemy fire. Since its introduction, the Terrapin space frame has become increasingly more popular among civilian explorers. As a result, surplus Terrapin hulls have started routinely becoming available on the open market, and it's known to be a favorite explorer ship among military veterans who, through practical experience, have already come to know firsthand just how reliable this ship is. The Terrapin is armed with a single nose turret that houses two size 2 guns on it. The turret cannot be removed, but its weapons can be replaced with any other type of gun that fits within the same size category. Terrapins are usually not outfitted with weapons that have expendable ammunition like ballistics, mainly because this ship is designed to be self-sufficient without having to depend on being resupplied for extended periods of time. And it's for the same reason that the Terrapin doesn't come equipped with any missiles. It also does not have any escape pods. If you have to bail out of the ship, the pilot and any optional crewmen are meant to escape through the side door. Ejection seats tend to require a soft spot in the ship to launch out of, and the Terrapin was designed so that the hull's integrity would not be structurally compromised in any way. For components, it comes stock with a medium-sized computer, radar, and power plant. It has two small coolers, fuel intakes, and fuel tanks, and it has a single small quantum drive jump module and quantum fuel tank. Its top speed is 1,204, and its maneuverability is basically what you'd expect from a flying tank. It stops with the grace of a Mack truck and accelerates at a slow and even pace. So make sure to keep that in mind as you're approaching a landing zone. For onboard amenities, it has a bed, a full bathroom, what appears to be a microwave, internal access for all of its components, an armor locker, a weapons rack, and some additional storage compartments that can be used to carry a few small items. Over the years, it's developed a reputation for being the kind of ship that can travel beyond distant jump points, and is more than capable of bringing you back again to civilization in one piece. The standard Terrapin Explorer is rated for a maximum crew of two, which consists of a pilot and a scanner operator, although one person can easily fill both positions. The onboard accommodations are only meant for one, but in true military fashion it's designed for one person to sleep while the other one continues to operate the vessel. Terrapin captains often refer to themselves as drivers rather than pilots, which is a nod to the ship's similarity to being a flying tank. 
It has a utility mount that's set into the top of the ship that can be used for a number of different functions. But it'll most likely have a dish-shaped scanner installed, since that component is most often used for a majority of its intended roles. Like exploratory scanning, search and rescue, and when acting as an armored command and control ship. Where most spacecraft designs increase the size of their engines to travel faster, further, or to make it more nimble, the Terrapin takes the exact opposite approach. Here an enhanced power plant is used to allow the ship to be equipped with as much armor and shielding as possible. The extensive latticework of thick armor plating that lines the hull should be visible to anyone within range of a Terrapin. Its ablative sheets, which are three layers deep, protects the top and bottom of the hull with an additional set of thick exterior bulkheads which are mounted onto each side. The ship is heavy and solid, making it slow to accelerate both in space and within an atmosphere. But its incredibly strong four VTOL thrusters are going to provide a high level of stability when traveling at lower altitudes. There's no cargo storage within the ship, but there's nothing stopping players from putting down cargo boxes wherever they choose to within the cabin. Salvage can also be dropped anywhere. But that loose cargo and salvage would not be as safe as it would be if it was locked down onto a dedicated cargo grid. Transporting loose cargo is done at the pilot's own risk and is generally not recommended. The ship's travel range has been described as being very long, which, when you look at its list of components, seems to be either a bit of a contradiction or an over-exaggeration of its abilities. It's labeled as having two small fuel tanks which puts it on the same level as most small light fighters, which are going to be most definitively short-ranged. However, fuel tanks are bespoke to a particular ship, and not all fuel tanks are going to be of the same size, even if they do fit under the same size category. The Terrapin is described as packing a much bigger hydrogen and quantum fuel tank to increase its operational range, and that it's designed to stay out in the verse for as long as possible. Even though I don't see this ship matching up to this current description, I doubt that it'll stay this way as the universe continues to expand in size and as individual ships' abilities are altered to better fit their intended roles. Exploration involves a number of different possible activities, not all of which involves taking material things home with them. Being true to its original design as an Intel and Recon ship, the Terrapin is going to be more concerned with finding, cataloging, reporting critical bits of information, and discovering points of interest than it's going to be with taking home incidental bits of salvage, trinkets, or loose resources. The Terrapin's emphasis on scanning and detection makes it ideal for exploring and data processing larger volumes of space more efficiently than many of its other explorer contemporaries. It may not be able to recover a lot of souvenirs, but the real point behind the Terrapin is to locate valuable points of interest. When you bring the Terrapin home, you can sell that information to other parties, or call in friends, guild members, or NPCs who are interested in exploiting the resources that you found for them. Or you can keep the secrets for yourself and come back with a ship that's designed specifically to take advantage of whatever it was that you found out there. The Terrapin's focus is going to be on data collecting, which is going to be worth its SCU weight in gold. Selling a mining spot on a virgin world, or finding the location of the most wanted pirate lord in three systems is what the Terrapin's pilot is going to be all about, and those are going to be the paydays that they're going to be chasing. The Terrapin was designed for the UEE military to provide reconnaissance capabilities to the rest of the fleet, and as well as extend the Navy's ability to provide a patrol presence to border systems that couldn't be supplied with a capital ship or large fighting garrisons for defense. Although the Terrapin was purpose-built for recon, overwatch, and picket duty, the military is known for making good use of whatever is available. So the Terrapin's supplemental military roles as a search and rescue ship and makeshift troop transport arose as a matter of need, in situations where the Argo wasn't sufficiently capable of handling the task while under fire. It's been repeatedly questioned just how the Terrapin was capable of being used as an armored transport, dropship, and rescue vessel, even though there aren't any secure seats found within it. There are going to be different levels of customization options that are found within various ships. For example, the Retaliator has two modular rooms within it. The Vanguard has a drop-in, drop-out crew escape module. And the Cutlass is going to have an interior with hardpoints that can accept different types of equipment. While the Terrapin's interior isn't modular, they're looking at creating a way that would allow them to play with its interior space and allows for the installation of a few jump seats. Remember that the Terrapin wasn't specifically designed for this role, but the military found it useful for the situation regardless, 
even considering that it wasn't part of the original mission profile. The utility mount is also going to have some level of customization to it, and is meant to be compatible with other types of specialized forms of equipment. This is something that we're going to be seeing more of as additional support non-combat ships are revealed, which is going to allow this ship to basically act as a heavily armored utility platform. The Terrapin's radar dish and scanning array are used to enhance the range and capabilities of the installed radar and scanner. Right now the utility mount is primarily used for equipping sensors and scanners at this time, but they're also going to be used for exploring the possibility for other options to be used with these kinds of mounts. Current ideas include some command, control, and communication equipment that would allow the Terrapin to take particular advantage of its optional two-man crew to oversee and direct groups of combat fighters. A present-day analog to this would be supporter scout helicopters that some armies use in conjunction with Hilo gunships. Some other options that they're considering includes a small mining laser, tractor beam, salvage claw, and even possibly a repair gun. The trouble with having a medium-sized component in a small ship is that it has the potential to create a large signature. And in making it heavily armored, the ship just doesn't have the capacity to vent its heat as efficiently as a pilot would want. So in order to combat this, its armor has to be designed to retract, allowing the panels to lift apart. This would structurally weaken the ship, but would also improve venting, allowing the player to effectively come up for air when needed. In terms of detection, some concern has been expressed as to whether the Terrapin can do its job and still be able to keep tabs on the enemy, even from a distance because when it's in operation, the Terrapin could give off a large signature due to its oversized shield and power plant. It's worth noting that you can affect your craft's signature by choosing which systems to power up or shut down. Nearly every ship will have a larger signature when its power plant and generators are running hot. The Terrapin may have the signature of a medium-sized ship when its shields are up, but not so much when its shields are down and the output to its power plant dialed back. This is going to be the standard operating procedure when the Terrapin's listening as opposed to fighting, which is an aspect of the intended stealth and signature gameplay mechanics in general. It's easy to forget about this aspect of combat when you spend most of your time playing Arena Commander, where most battles are fought in a fairly straightforward manner, with your power plant pouring all of its energy directly into the weapons and shields, which are going to be constantly building up heat for the duration of the battle. In short, when a Terrapin's crew is stalking or shadowing an enemy, a good crew should be focused on attenuating the ship's energy signature, so that the Terrapin sensors will have a lot better chance of detecting a small signature that's farther away than whatever's creating that small signature would have at detecting the Terrapin. And if it's attacked while the Terrapin shields are down, its heavy armor will provide the protection it needs to not get one-shotted as it powers back up and attempts to make its escape. The Terrapin may not have been designed as a stealth ship, but the basic principles of stealth are going to apply to it just as much as they do for other ships like the Ghost, the Eclipse, and even the Sabre. Nearly half of a ship's passive signature comes from its engines, and almost the rest of it comes from its shields. If you power these two systems down, its signature greatly decreases. And you can take that one step further with the Terrapin by retracting the armor, which will increase its defensive abilities and reduce its heat signature even further. It can also extend out a wide radar net that it can use to detect incoming craft. And if any of them get too close, then all you have to do is power up the ship and get the hell out of there before they get close enough to pick you up on their sensors. One major concern that I've heard about this ship is that it would be perfect if you could remove the scanner chair and open up that space for cargo or even a small vehicle. Which it is completely possible to get a Nox or a Greycat inside of the Terrapin. But if you try, there's a good chance that you're going to end up getting it wedged somewhere in between the wall and the chair. The bad news is that the scanning station is plugged directly into the upper and lower utility mounts and acts as the operational heart of the ship, so it's not going to be able to be removed even if you swap the radar dish out for something else. The good news is that this ship is designed so you should never have to use a vehicle in conjunction with the Terrapin. Now, don't get me wrong, it'd still be fun to have that option. And I'm thinking that if you swapped out the radar dish for a tractor beam, then you might be able to. But for now, the ship is small enough to be able to hop from any landing zone to another. And its powerful four VTOL engines should keep it remarkably stable even when you're just skirting the surface of a planet or when cutting through some of the choppiest weather conditions. 
The ship earns its money by recording information and bringing it back, so you should never have to get any closer than its optimal scanning range away from your target in order to be able to get what you need. So there's no reason for you to have to travel out to a destination by vehicle. And if you still want to, the Terrapin is going to be small and stable enough that you should be able to fly right up to wherever it is that you want to go. If you directly compare these two ships, each one will seem to have a distinct advantage over the other in some way, but there's always going to be a trade-off to it. Like for instance, the Terrapin has bigger shields and thicker armor, but the 315P is more maneuverable. It flies faster and comes equipped with bigger weapons. The Terrapin does have a distinct advantage with regards to its components loadout, having a medium-sized computer, radar, power plant, and shield generator. While the 315P has a single small radar, power plant, and computer, and two small shield generators. All their remaining components are the same, but being a military ship, the Terrapin is going to be equipped with military-grade components. The trade-off for this is that the Terrapin is still a small ship but its oversized components are going to give off the same signature as a medium-sized ship when it's fully powered up. One distinct advantage that the 315P has over the Terrapin is cost. They both have in-game prices right now, which are going to fluctuate over the course of the game's development, but the actual store prices for these ships are not even comparable, with the 315P being $65 and the Terrapin being $220. Both ships have a utility mount, which is where a lot of their versatility is going to come from. The default option for the Terrapin is going to be its radar dish, which can intensify its scanning and radar capabilities. This is going to be very useful, but it's also a passive ability, which may be appealing to some people and not to others depending on what your playstyle is. While the 315P comes with a forward mounted tractor beam whose abilities are going to be more kinetic by trade. This ability alone is going to make it a good companion to nearly every other kind of career-based craft that you could work with. This is going to make it useful in aiding with salvage operations, mining runs, and even with moving vehicles and cargo around. The Terrapin's inherent level of utility seems to be more suited for supporting military operations and armadas by acting as an advanced scout, a search and rescue vessel, a dropship, or as a command and control center. While the 315P seems to favor supporting civilian endeavors, by helping out with mining operations, salvage runs, and freight hauling. The Terrapin is going to be able to install other types of utility components, including a tractor beam, but that's going to require you to add these things in as an aftermarket item, and at your own expense, while the 315P comes equipped with a tractor beam by default. The ability to store and transport cargo is another advantage that the 315P has over the Terrapin. It has one of the largest cargo capacities for a ship of its size that stores its cargo internally. This is going to allow it to carry more than just cargo, like items that they've salvaged from a derelict ship, which could include weapons, components, or any other valuable pieces of equipment that you may come across. Or you could store extra items in a container and keep them in the cargo hold, which could be used to expand out your inventory space. But the flip side to this is that the Terrapin doesn't have a cargo bay because it isn't going to need it. It deals in transporting data and not goods, and once it's full of all the data that its banks can carry, its fuel efficiency and ability to maneuver are not going to change. While a fully loaded down 315P is going to feel it, not only in how its engines perform, but also in how much extra fuel it's going to consume. Plus, you can still drop off salvage items and cargo boxes in the cabin of the Terrapin. They're just not going to be secured down like they would be on a cargo grid. The Terrapin's designed to make its money by selling data that it collects, and that's how it's going to approach its role when it comes to exploring, while the 315P is going to focus more on collecting trinkets, incidental salvage, and other physical items while exploring in order to turn a profit. In the end, these two ships represent the best of your options when it comes to the Pathfinder classification of explorer ships. The real difference lies in what kind of player you are, and what kind of options are going to be the most appealing to you. The Anvil Terrapin is extremely well protected, not only because of its oversized shields, but also its defensive layers of heavy armor that actually retracts into place, making it more of a tank than a ship. It has long-range scanning capabilities that allows it to see well beyond the ranges of most other vessels. And if you cut the power and retract the armor, the ship is going to be near invisible to the radar systems of even some of the larger craft. The Terrapin's endurance, advanced sensor suite, and range play into its ability to act as an explorer ship. 
It earns money by collecting data that it later sells off to interested parties. A private operator can use this ship to gather and sell data on a specific point of interest and do risky deep scans of hostile environments as opposed to collecting tangibles for sale. This is going to be one of the biggest differences between these two ships and the main deciding factors to which one of them would be more appealing. The Terrapin's a min-maxer in every sense. It also has a layer of versatility that's more useful in a military capacity or when being used as part of an advanced fleet of ships, by acting as their scout, an armored dropship, a search and rescue vessel, or as a heavily protected command and control center. It's also going to be able to swap out the scanner dish for a variety of other add-ons. And as I stated before, one of the few downsides to this ship is going to be the price. The Terrapin is a far more expensive ship than the 315P. Next is the kind of gameplay that the ship offers, which isn't designed to satisfy that instinctive need that a lot of players have to collect and gather things in order to feel like they're progressing in the game, which is a system that a lot of traditional gaming mechanics tends to revolve around. Instead it scans and retrieves data, and it doesn't require you to spend any more time picking at derelicts or ore deposits after you've discovered them. But if you find that aspect of gameplay to be tedious, then this can be considered as a positive trait and an even more appealing feature of this ship. And lastly, the Terrapin is more defensive in nature, and it uses its sensors to avoid conflict rather than seek it out. Which could be a more relaxing and enjoyable experience for some players, and a less satisfying one to others. The 315P may not be as well protected or have as good of a components loadout as the Terrapin, but it does have better offensive capabilities, plus it's faster and more maneuverable. It also has all the same basic onboard amenities, but has a much more finished and less spartan look to its appearance. This is, once again, going to be more appealing to some people and less appealing to others. It also has a lot of utility thanks to its tractor beam, which may not be as useful to an armada of military ships, but would be a very helpful addition to any group of miners, cargo haulers, or salvagers. The amount of internal cargo space is going to present it with opportunities that are not going to be open to the Terrapin. And in the end, it's going to have more of a hands-on approach to exploring, where in order to make money, you're going to have to physically investigate the sites that you discover, and bring back the best that each one has to offer. And when you're not doing that, you could supplement your income by running cargo, or offering your services to other groups as a support vessel. Plus it acts as a really good personal transport ship. And lastly, it's also a lot less expensive than the Terrapin. The only downside to this ship is that it seems to take exploring a lot less seriously than the Terrapin does, and still generalizes with a lot of its abilities. It's good at doing a number of things while not being too outstanding in any one particular area. Ideally, if you're looking at getting into the Explorer career path, and find the basic pathfinders don't offer enough to wet your palate, and the larger ships are just, well, too large for the amount of people that you're running with, then it's only going to be natural that your attention would eventually gravitate towards either the Terrapin or the 315P. The Explorer path is going to be for anyone who wants to make money by finding and investigating wrecks, hidden outposts, or ore veins, but may find the actual act of salvaging or mining to be too tedious for their liking. Exploration creates an opportunity for you to still be able to indulge in some of the most fun aspects of these jobs, by allowing you to be able to explore wrecks and taking the best items and components for yourself or to do some FPS mining and take some small but valuable shards back with you as a bonus. And on top of that, you can sell the location of these points of interest to an information broker for even more profit. Or you could spend your time searching for new jump points, or go scouting out locations for a client to build their outposts on. For anyone who's looking to indulge in any of these adventures but doesn't have a crew to run with, then the Pathfinders are going to be the way to go. And out of all the Pathfinders, the 315P and the Terrapin are two of your best options. Hopefully this video should help anyone who's looking into getting a Pathfinder, and to be able to base that decision on what kind of gameplay that they're more interested in, what your price range is, and what the kinds of additional features are that you're looking for. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of Versus. I'd like to thank everybody for liking and subscribing to the channel, and a special thanks goes out to my backers who, without their support, I wouldn't be able to keep doing this. If you'd like to become a patron and help support the channel, you can find a link to my Patreon site in the description of this video. I'm your host, Law of the West. Thanks for tuning in, and take care.